Hello, everybody. So I think it's five past seven. I hope this is a good time to start. If some people will join later, then I hope they will catch up. Um, my name is Tony, and I will send you a warm welcome to everyone. And thank you so much for joining tonight. And I would love to welcome you on behalf of the lecture series committee. A few people are sitting here with me, and I'm saying hi on their behalf. Firstly, a small housekeeping request. Please make sure your microphone is still muted and you can put your cameras on if you want. If you have any questions that arise during the talk, please feel free to put them in the chat. We will collect them or you can ask them later after the talk. We will record the talk, but not the Q&A if you were worrying about this and a short and brief introduction about us, about the Design Academy lecture series. We are a talks program run and led by students, um, whether in the form of debates, talks, lectures like this one right now, panel discussions. Initially it was intended for DAE students and now it is open to the public. And by bringing in diverse perspectives, our goal is to create a space for critical debates and thinking in the field of design through all disciplines and positions. We seek to generate discussions relevant how to to our practices and how they are relating to current and ongoing um, societal discourse. The topic for our this year's theme is the collective or collectiveness and this brings of course various questions and opens a conversation to the role of design and how we as designer can create the collectiveness from within. Um, I would also like to acknowledge in this moment, as we share the notion of collectiveness right now and are together collaborating today in, in this moment of sharing thoughts and that we stand together and we are able to participate today because of the privilege um, and we share and keep that in mind. And I would also like to stand in solidarity with the people that are right now suffering in Ukraine. Um, so the momentum is incredibly challenging right now. We bear only good energy and thoughts and hopes for them in mind. And bearing this thought, um, I would like to move ahead, standing together, engaging with the topic of collectiveness and um, welcome the founders of Systems of Systems here with us tonight, Neo, Rebecca Klinblanco and Maria McClintock. Um, short about System of Systems, it's a research project working at the nexus of public programming, publishing and practice. And they're addressing the use of technology and bureaucracy in the migration processing systems in Europe. The project was found in 2016. In 2017, they published their first book. And a, systems of system, a system of systems, they see the importance of a long-term commitment to focus, not just on the individual migrant experience, but specifically on the system that produce and process migration under the pretense of security. They were collaborating with artists and architects along with policy experts and activists and they endeavor to examine migration processing systems from multiple perspectives and their work um, renders the highly complex system accessible for non-specialists while also supporting the continued work of specialists i am very happy we are very happy to have you today especially in these uncertain times so a warm welcome and thank you so much Janae and Rebecca for speaking tonight. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for your invitation. We're super happy to be here with you and to talk more about our research and what we've been looking into more recently. Uh, I am Danai, I'm an artist and I also teach at the Design Academy in the Critical Inquiry Lab. And uh, yeah. I'm Rebecca, I'm a um, designer of sorts, but also um, an academic, um, and I teach at Goldsmiths um, in the design department. And part of our project, I mean, an integral member is Maria, but Maria wasn't able to make it into the talk. Uh, but all of our work is made collectively. So the work that we will be talking about today is something that stems from the three of us as a group. Yeah. Um, I start sharing the screen, my screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Is that okay? Hmm? You see that fine? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see your heads as well? No. No, okay. I need to see that. your heads. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll start then. So System of Systems uh, is built on a collaboration with each other as a group uh, and others outside of us, uh, three. And like a group, we research together, we try to build a common understanding, we compromised, we argue, we disagree. But we write, we write in the same Google Docs, we edit each other's work, and we produce together all the work that we have made so far and we often invite other people to join us and we ask to join others and although we don't usually foreground our working relationship we thought that maybe it's a good thing to mention now in this occasion when collaboration collectivity is the theme um, in this talk, we will mainly focus on the current contents of our research, but we will keep collectivity or collectiveness in mind as we understand how it can pertain to exclusivity or exclusion just as much as inclusion and participation. As System of Systems, we have been looking into migration processing practices since 2016, as Tony mentioned through multidisciplinary research, interrogating the use of technology and bureaucracy at the borders in, in and of Europe, primarily through the European Union. Uh, we collaborate with artists, architects, designers, policy experts, academics and activists to bring together uh, and produce research. This has resulted in exhibitions, publications and events, as you see in these slides. Um, our aim is to approach in, our aim and approach in the project is to render these processes that are quite complex uh, more legible outside of the spheres of expertise of let's say border studies and uh, to try and not make assumptions about the very complex uh, words and terminology that is being used with, in describing those systems. Uh, at the same time, we also value the aesthetic and spatial sensibility that other practitioners have. Uh, this is why we also really value the work that artists and designers can bring to this issue through their own research. Um, as such, questioning the assumed positions of knowledge and confronting this issue, often contained within policy or legal or academic spheres, um, we try to make them a bit more accessible for a wider audience. And we, would, we could think of, I guess, our projects as a frame through which to examine and re-examine those complex and overlapping practices of migration as they change over time. The title of our project originally stems from a term used by the EU's major management bodies to describe its largest surveillance system, Eurosur together with the European Border and Coast Guard Agency, Frontex. Um, Eurosur's operations merge to form a network of technologies that, as they state, uh, deliver a quote, uh, frictionless circulation of identity data within a single globalized market of information, end quote. The process of controlling migration is indeed a system, yet it is composed of multiplicity of embedded systems, not the supposedly frictionless one that, they, that is asserted by the EU's borders and migration management bodies. The EU's migration management strategy involves a lot of state and non-state actors, a flourishing border market and policies, as well as infrastructures that extend much further than the lines that mark the EU's borders. When we began the project six years ago, the question of managing migration or border management with the emphasis on the word management was less prominent, but now it has become quite central to our understanding as we will try to show.
So in response to the invitation to this talk, we wanted to address the question of collectiveness or collectivity, as Danai has said. Um, the values ascribed to collectivity are generally good ones, we assume. This is reflected in the value attributed to them in creative spheres, uh, spheres such as um, inclusion, participation, solidarity, equality, etc. We've been interested in how a collaborative body like the European Union uses these values as a way to further empower itself and in fact exclude, meanwhile using this bene benevolent notion of inclusion through unity. We don't mean to conflate the meaning of collaborative and collective. We should think more about their specific function as ideas, but we can recognize how they speak to each other and hold values in common, as well as language roots, obviously, um, through the notion of being with or working together. We think that maybe while a collective may try to give more equal agency to its members, um, maybe more in line with what you're bringing to this, um, to this word, a collaboration can be often fraught and unequal. The EU is composed of a group of nations. There are clear power structures that differentiate the different um, levels of agency that its members have, but they must all work to, together towards a common goal. Another inherent problem is that for the union to be formed, exclusion is always necessary. By deciding which nation states are included in EU membership, the boundaries around citizenship and therefore rights are drawn. Since the focus of our talk rests on how the EU institutes itself through migration policy, we wanted to highlight that collaboration perhaps is not a de facto positive thing and its underlying conditions are to be questioned. Marcus Meerson has prominently written about the violence of participation in art as well as um, politics. In his book, The Nightmare of Participation, he writes, um, quote, participation is often read through romantic notions of negotiation, inclusion and democratic decision making. However, it is precisely this often unquestioned mode of inclusion that does not produce significant results. Indeed, End quote. Indeed, the EU reveals the exclusivity and inequality of a union, while often congratulating itself for the opposite. Our most recent strands of research examine how the very notion of Europe is increasingly maintained through migration policies, rendered a destination for some and a space to be protected for others. We're interested in how the cohesion of Europe is dependent on defining its others through migration policy. As sociology professor Gerard Delanti states in Inventing Europe, um, quote, immigration laws are the crux of European identity. For these are the instruments Europe uses to restrict democracy and civil rights, which are reserved for the privileged. So long as citizenship remains linked to nationality, the conviction will remain that citizenship laws exist in order to protect protect the unity and cohesion of the dominant culture from foreign cultures. Delante claims that migration laws and policy are at the heart of European identity, since they define who is able to be part of this identity or not. It is telling that in 2019 to 2024, um, in, in the priorities defined by the European Commission for this period, um, the European Union Commission, um, they defined one of their main goals as promoting our European way of life, suggesting that the promotion of our European way of life at once, at once denotes the exclusion of others. We feel like this example concisely shows that migration and asylum policy is a necessary mechanism to building the European identity that constitutes the quoted our way of life. Also, just to mention that within the, um, the goal that is promoting our European way of life, all the, the, the new pact for migration and asylum policy falls within that framework, that broader goal, which is promoting our European way of life. 
Um, the EU spends an ever-increasing ever budget to deter migrations. In the last five years, we have seen the, incre the increasing use of the word management in migration policy, as well as technologies. Our kind research, as we work towards our next book, is concerned with how and why migration has become an issue to be managed rather than something else. What does it mean for migration to be managed? And how is the border produced through management? Rising for the UN Chronicle in 2013, Douglas S. Macy advocates for the move towards management as a way to shift away from restriction. Rather than putting up the, a physical wall or fence, he suggests, nations should be cooperating with other nations, quote, walking bilaterally with leaders in those nations to enact policies that facilitate international movement, encourage circulation, and harness the energies and, and earnings of migrants to promote development at home while providing these nations with development assistance to facilitate the transition to an industrial service economy, end quote. We, of course, approach this uh, explanation with suspicion. Management is a technocratic word. It seems soft and malleable, while restriction is hard and definite. There is the illusion that management can spread everywhere, like everything can be managed. Development becomes subsumed by management, perhaps overtaking previous humanitarian understandings. And security as well becomes an issue of management rather than more overt foreign intervention. Though it is a newer term, we will focus on its history through Europe's colonial view of migration as an issue to be managed, both within and beyond its periphery through a border system that extends much further than its physical walls, made up of policies, technologies, fin financial instruments, and border markets. Whether there's a physical wall or not, migration management is violent. Through three examples, we will unpack how Europe maintains, exclu ugh, maintains exclusion through one, funding innovation in security and surveillance technologies, to practices of externalization, which means placing uh, Europe's borders far beyond uh, where Europe is, and three legal constructs. It is true that, this that these practices are observable across the world. Europe takes much inspiration from the US and the UK loves Australian border management styles. Yet Europe has uniquely found a way to coordinate practices across discrete nation states through which it upholds a notion of itself. Border technologies are sites of huge investment and profit. For the next financial period, Frontex will receive up to 11 billion euros from the U uh, European Union. Aside from the funding the EU secures towards migration, innovation in border technology is also funded through other EU programmes like Horizon 2020 and the more recent Horizon Europe. With a focus on promoting, quote, excellent science, industrial leadership and tackling societal challenges to ensure Europe's global competitiveness, end quote. As such, these funding bodies act as the research and development precursors of border technologies. They fund university research units and startups alike to develop emerging technologies that surveil, restrict, or predict border crossings under the guise of innovation and security. With names such as I Border Control, Trespass, or Sunny. While innovation is often placed at the center of these companies' incentives, let's not forget that their motivation for existing is largely financial. Migration and border technologies are an emerging market ready to be saturated. To give a, um, so these are some of the projects that, um, in the next few slides, the projects that have been funded by uh, Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe um, that then become used by 
by um, Frontex. Um, to give a local example of a project funded by the Horizon 2020 program, which um, aims at developing border technologies um, local to the Netherlands, I'm currently in London, so not local to me. <laughs> Um, the project D4 Flight, detecting document fraud and identity, um, which is on the bottom left corner here, um, will develop a set of tools and systems to address emerging threats in document and identity verification and aims to be used by Netherlands Immigration and Naturalization Service, among others. They say that the D4 Flight will include a border control kiosk smartphone apps and an on-the-move system. This list of projects is very long and constantly growing. We don't have time to go into them, but we can point to some interesting generalities. Firstly, um, the, the development of border management technologies involves many actors, including the state, universities and um, private companies working together for research and innovation aims. We're quite interested in what the role of universities is actually in this kind of research and knowledge production and secondly it's kind of remarkable how each company positions itself as a total solution how how exactly these companies plan to work together is hard to say but they all um, envision uh, like they all have this promise of connecting everything up and filling all the information gaps that could possibly exist um, Emergent biometric technologies are part of a broad vision of sustaining borders through data, through which the border becomes flexible and movable, sometimes porous, sometimes not. Frontex exists as a node in a networked infrastructure that as a whole encourages the accelerating development of technologies to assist in border management operations. Examples range from the use of biometrics for logging data on migrants, through a fingerprint database shared across member states called EuroDAC, or biometrics on the move technology, which aims to cross the border almost seamlessly thanks to face recognition and touchless scanning of fingerprints. Um, the proposed entry exit system that collects data of border crossing of third country nationals at the external border of the EU, abolishing passport stamps, and the sprawling continent wide surveillance system that we've mentioned called EUROSA. Increasingly, technologies are moving towards gathering data towards prediction, not only surveillance, and they exist beyond the imagined border, on land, on sea, in the air, and as we'll talk about in camps. To give an example, um, yeah, we'll describe the development of this new incident management centre in Greece. The initiation of the Incident Management Center was announced through a tweet by the Greek Minister of Migration and Asylum, Nautis Midaraktis, in 2021, September, I think. Um, in a presentation titled Nations, National Strategy for Migration 2020-2021, Protecting the Aegean Islands, the Ministry of Migration and Asylum outlined what they call a holistic approach to deterring migration through the development of new closed camps equipped with surveillance technologies. In this presentation, the eerily named system CENTAUR is described as, quote, an integrated digital system of electronic and physical security management placed inside and around the facilities using cameras and emotion analysis algorithm, in parenthesis, AI behavioral analytics. End quote. This system includes the aforementioned incident management center, which is the architecture connecting and overseeing the surveillance of all camps, a physical room located in the same building as the Ministry of Asylum, of Migration and Asylum in the Athens periphery. At the moment, the incident management center is connected to the closed camps of, of Samos, uh, with the intention to being integrated to the five remaining technologized camps. The, those are the new closed camps that have been developed on the Aegean islands. 
Um, and by 2024, it hope, they hope to connect to all 36 camps across Greece. The system will include thermographic devices, X-ray devices, and manned drones surveilling the camps, and around 40 camp, 40 installed cameras in each camp to monitor migrants, among others. The unmanned drones are to be controlled by the Incident Management Center, which is in Athens. And if a risk emerges, the staff from the uh, management center alerts the guards of the specific camp in question, which forms an entirely dystopian uh, realization of surveillance of a space with absolutely no privacy, let alone all the other violent aspects of camps already. It reveals the, the acceleration of predictive technology implemented in new migration management strategies to foresee and prevent events. CENTAUR aims to predict and flag potential threats to detect suspicious behavior. There is no information on how exactly the behavioral analysis algorithm works beyond that. Usually, AI behavior analytics systems work by identifying patterns within a set of data and predicting possible occurrences based on those patterns. However, there is no more information on the kind of data that is being collected and questions around privacy and whether this system will follow the, will follow the general data protection regulation are still unanswered. The rhetoric of prevention of possible threats is often justified by evoking past tragedies. Notis Mitarakis, the Greek migration minister, told Al Jazeera, quote, we use technology to prevent, to prevent violence, to prevent events like we had in Moria, the arson of the camp, because safety is critical for everyone, end quote. Or as Salis, one of the architects of the system center, says, quote, this was not to monitor and invade the privacy of people in the camps. You're not monitoring them. You're trying to prevent bad things from happening, end quote. As Petra Morner puts it in her recent report to Technological Testing Grounds, Quote, states are able to justify increasing, increasing technological experiments in migration because people on the move have been historically rendered as a population which is intelligible, trackable, and manageable. End quote. The technological testing ground is an enactment of a future reality following Jackie Wang. Quote, in the political realm, realm the, conjunction, the conjuration of an imminent threat gives authority to the policies that are, implemented, that are being implemented in the present. Thus, predictions do much more than present us with a probable outcome. They enact the future, end quote. While Wang is writing on the carceral system, the same applies to migration management, which looks, which looks increasingly like the carceral one through the creation of closed camps and detention centers. Centaur demonstrates the EU's latest vision of the integrated camp, where people's actions are monitored at all times with complex technologies in prison-like conditions, connected to an all-seeing room. Coupled with this vision of total management of people on the move through monitoring, prediction finds its way more prominently in migration policy as a way to manage what has not yet happened. An example of the extent to which prediction is meant to be implemented in migration management system, systems is the It Flows project, which you see some screenshots of the promotional video the Eight Flows project, project aims to deliver um, accurate predictions of irregular migration flows to the EU based on a wide range of human factors and using multiple sources of information. End quote. 
It also makes the claim to, quote, provide management solutions for different phases of migration processes, including reception, relocation, settlement, and integration, end quote. We can see that predictive algorithm algorithms aim to be introduced in all aspects of migration management, from predicting migration waves and border crossings to preventing threats within close camps. Under the technocratic word of management, people on the move are being subjected to an endless amount of overly technological systems of control and violence. All the while, as a recent EU Parliament report admits, we know very little about the AI the EU is so, in, in, is so um, trying to make widespread, for example, through smart borders. Because there is, there is not very clear data on what information is being uh, recorded and what are the specifics of the algorithms that are being used in a public way. Integrated border management, we're making a slight jump here. Um, integrated border management is a commonly used term to describe collaboration across countries, um, organizations and technologies in the management of borders. It is a difficult term to unravel because it, in, it seems to encompass everything all at once. It, it exemplifies the desire to create the border as an efficient, seamless and securitized entity um, management is, is integrated into the systems that process people via technology and through integration the border is no longer a physical threshold but a set of remote operations working in tandem. The integrated border is op opaque for some and transparent for, for others. We could say that the integrated border management vision is the vision of the system of systems, not our system of systems. Um, it is defined by the European Commission as national, uh, quote, national and international coordination and cooperation among all relevant authorities and agencies involved in border security and trade facilitation to establish effective, efficient and coordinated border management at the external EU borders in order to reach the objective of open but well controlled and secure borders. According to EU BAM, the EU Border Assistance Mission, Quote, integrated border management may sound like another piece of technical jargon, it really does, but is actually the concept the EU has embraced for coherent and coordinated border management systems. It is designed to ensure that governments maintain secure borders with as little inconvenience to travellers and cross-border trade as possible. IBM requires collaboration between EU and non-EU nations to uphold internal borders through externalization practices and maintain external borders in the interest of the internal um, EU interests. So border externalization is the practice of putting the border in third countries. Third countries are a category developed by the EU itself to mean any country that exists outside it. The European border externalization process involves outsourcing the management of the EU borders to countries beyond the Union through an am um, amalgamation of programs, financial instruments and policies. Such strategies operate often within a legal grey zone and systematically violate human rights, impacting the countries in which they're implemented while enacting an outsourcing of coercion, detention, surveillance and control. So to give an example of this um, vision of IBM um, is, is the, the project, the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa, um, which funds biometric da databases, security training and surveillance equipment while promoting itself as an emergency development fund. It's carried out through the building of infrastructure and huge investment in third countries, as you can see on this map and it implements preventive measures on behalf of Europe to deter and manage migration to the continent. The EUTF was established in 2015 to tackle the root causes of migration, um, 
namely conflict or economic instability, which lead to displacement in search of safety or livelihoods. It was said to be ending in 2021. And EUTF was a package of actions currently worth 5 billion euros, divided into these three zones, North of Africa, the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. According to the European Commission, it was set up to, quote, help the most vulnerable and marginalised people, including refugees, internally displaced persons, migrants and members of host com communities. One of the EUTF's primary goals has been to improve migration management. Managing migration in this instance has been primarily focused on aiding voluntary returns within African nations and tackling people smuggling. As their January 2021 report says, the North of Africa window will continue contributing to an improved migration management by focusing in particular on supporting improved migration governance, supporting labour migration and mobility, protecting vulnerable migrants, voluntary return and sustainable reintegration, as well as community stabilisation and integrated border management. Um, researcher David Kipp writes that through the EUTF, an increasingly instrumental understanding of development cooperation emerges, one in which the primary objective is not to improve living conditions, but to reduce refugee movements and irregular migration to Europe. Furthermore, the security of Europe has become a driver of development in Africa, veiling the prevention of migration to Europe. Um, so what we're saying is that this is, a this is a coordinated effort to fund projects in Africa that under the guise of development and security of nations in Africa, but ultimately um, in the interests of stopping people migrating to Europe. It relies on the assumption that it is better for people to stay in their countries of origin by tackling the causes of forced displacement. It produced a perpetual cycle in which Europe's colonial history and accumulation of wealth triggers and perpetuates violence. For example, Romane Idrissa um, details how European in, in his case and invention perpetuates the conflict rife in the Sahel. And yet one of the primary reasons for the formation of EUTF is to tackle conflict in that region. Um, as such, it is evident how such investment in migration management through development is a continuation of colonial practices of extraction and domination rooted in European histories. As Idrissa writes, quote, one can even say that migration was a colonial invention in the sense that local customs were transformed by European practices and ideas with regard to mobility. The concept of migration as understood today derives from the concept of national borders, which did not exist in the region before colonialism. Through the fervent consolidation of borders, a new kind of displacement may be said to emerge. Border induced, um, border -induced displacement. Lemberg Pedersen and Moreno Laxin write that border induced displacement is caused by processes of extraterritorialization extra and externalization through which responsibility and accountability is attached from European actors. They write, quote, border induced displacement functions as a second order type of redisplacement produced precisely via the violence implicated in border control. The violence of the border will undoubtedly strengthen as climate induced catastrophe increases. European involvement in African countries affected by climate disasters already limits the ability to move within the continent towards safer climates in order to protect the possibility of access to Europe. With that in mind, we will now turn to the inextricable relationship between climate displacement um, and colonial pasts and presence. I think I just read your book. So you can read my book. I'll read your part. It's okay. <laughs> um, can I go to the next slide? Yeah. So the third part of our presentation is focusing on climate-induced displacement through the example of the 1951 Refugee Convention. 
Resource extraction, fossil capitalism, and ecological collapse have been central forces in shaping contemporary migration and migratory flows. While it is well known that climate change and subsequent economic, social, and political upheavals contribute to the forceful displacement of people, there is no legal instrument recognizing climate refugees. Currently, the legal basis that determines the legitimacy of an asylum claim is founded on the 1951 Refugee Convention. The convention defines a refugee as, quote, someone who is, who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being prosecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. Therefore, the recognition of climate change, displacement as a reason for accessing rights is currently seen as illegitimate. Legal scholar and activist Rada D'Souza in her book, What's Wrong With Rights, connects the severing, the, the severing of feudal land relations to the transformation of land into a commodity to be exchanged in the market, which allowed capitalist relations to become entrenched in systemic ways. She connects this moment of separation to the birth of legal rights. She writes, and we quote, we quote her here, the modern concept of rights owes its birth owes its birth to, the mom to that moment when land was transformed into a commodity and hundreds of thousands of people were evicted from the places they called their homeland. New theoretical concepts and legal mechanisms were needed to reconstitute society where both nature and labor could become saleable commodities." End quote. D'Souza with this quote demonstrates the role of capitalism in separating people from nature, rendering them into labor and commodities with law and rights becoming the arbitrators of these relationships. In this account, we can see that, that, we can see that displacement as well as land destruction have a common history dictated by the domination of European powers. Through European colonial domination, imperialism, the seizing of land, property and bodies, the global south was made into, quote, a construction site where everything could be made into raw material, end quote, according to Ariella Zule. This extractivist approach towards people and ecology continues through the exploitation of migrant labor and material resources by European powers. We see the, legal the legacies of imperialism, both in the continuous exploitation of migrant laborers, for example, for picking vegetables in EU countries, but also in Shell's oil extraction from the Niger Delta, which has polluted the surrounding areas and have left a number of villages uninhabitable. These are just a couple of examples, but the list, of course, goes on and on. As we said, there is currently no policy recognizing the existence of climate refugees. When the original document was drafted in 1951 and made into law in 1967, this was not a societal issue. Today, there is no consensus on what the definition would entail. We find this absence in migration management, in, in, this absence in, in law, an interesting point of departure to question more broadly, what is the role of law in migration management systems? Management approaches to migration invest in promoting legal migration and deter so-called illegal migration. This necessarily puts into question the basis on which legality is determined. The distinction being made is inherently problematic since what is considered illegal migration can technically change, but is also affected by non-legal 
public perceptions. In other words, illegality is a construct based not just on technicality of law, but on accepted norms. And it should be said, determined by a racist and racialized understandings of legitimacy. Tackling crime and tackling migration are brought often together through securitization and with horrific words that we've seen in uh, documentation of, in the EU, like crimigration. Uh, the supposed need to separate legal and illegal migrants through the apparatus of the law becomes the basis and reason for existence of a lethal border regime. In the case of, in the case of climate-induced migration, how are people already being legalized by the lack of definition? A World Bank report released in April 2019 estimates that climate change could force more than 140 million people to migrate internally within Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America and South Asia alone by 2050. The UN predicts a similar number might be displaced internationally just by desertification alone by 2045. The EU's huge spending on border militarization and externalization are linked to resource extraction and increased destruction, which in turn combine to amplify forced displacement. Ultimately, we believe that Europe has a responsibility in causing displacement through the intervention outside its borders, serving to protect its own interests and way of life as well as corporate material extraction, among others. Dragging its feet and acknowledging in law the impact of climate catastrophe on people seeking safety and actively producing lethal conditions of existence for millions of people. So we 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 ask ourselves what are the reasons for the lack of definition and therefore rights of climate refugees or climate migrants um eu member states have not prioritized it although it has been discussed over the past few years and there have been reports and um briefings on it um but they've preferred to focus on development related resilience as we've seen in projects like eutf so focusing on root causes rather than protection in the need, when the need arises to, um, to move um, or migrate. Another complication arises in that, according to the Refugee Convention, when a person is di displaced internally, i.e. within their own country, and not specifically persecuted by their state, their national government can and should still be responsible for them. In other words, Quote, it would be difficult to consider environmental degradation as persecution in the sense in which it is used in the Refugee Convention. Thirdly, it is considered difficult to determine whether displacement is climate change related. The European Parliament states that, quote, while, while climate specific events such as a particular storm may cause movement, the link between that storm and climate change is not necessarily easy to establish. Even if a legal definition does come about, it will not guarantee that rights are upheld or that exploitation will not occur. We already see how the current refugee convention is constantly misused and international law is being ignored in pushbacks, for example. A report from Todd Miller, Nick's, Nick Buxton and Mark Ackerman found that, quote, top border contractors boast of the potential to increase their revenue from climate change Raytheon says demand for its military products and services as security concerns may rise as results of droughts, floods and storm events occur as a result of climate change. Cobham, a British company that markets surveillance systems and is one of the main contractors for Australia's border security, says that changes to countries' resources and habitability could increase the need for border surveillance due to population migration. End quote. There is little doubt that technology will continue to be developed to deal with extreme climates too, 
as one horizon project called Foldout demonstrates. Foldout begins from the idea that, according to them, quote, detecting people through dense foliage in extreme climates with only a penetration technology is prone to high fault rates. They aim to build, quote, a system that combines various sensors and technologies and intelligently fuses these into an effective and robust intelligent de detection platform, end quote. This example shows the perpetuation of technological solutions to migration beginning to adapt to the effects of climate change on territories. Through the lack of legal, legal definition of climate migrants, we hope to problematize the legal categories that migrants are measured, measured against already. As legal scholar Nadine el writes, quote, the widespread acceptance of legal categories of people moving as defined in international European and domestic law normalizes the racial violence in which the legal system is implicated. Precluded is an understanding of the law as racial violence. Ideas and practices of racial ordering, which date back to the colonial era, are embedded in contemporary articulations of immigration, asylum and nationality law. Although the recognition of climate migrants could have some material effect in securing rights, we have seen very often how the EU's migration management system uses its legal apparatus to criminalize migrants. European colonialism, capitalism and extraction all play an important role in shaping the contemporary EU migration management system. First and foremost, we see the importance of dismantling these systems within which legality is obscured, which involves understanding the historical processes from which they emerge. We will conclude with a few summarizing points that we maybe can do together. Um, so we hope to have shown a glimpse of uh, how we've been examining Europe's uh, migration management systems. Um, and we would like to to show that um, Uh, yeah, the, the, the way that these systems pose and uh, I guess the way that the European identity is resting on the creation of, of, of these systems uh, that manage migration and how Europe sees itself by uh, organizing uh, a match a very broad um, migration management system should be questioned um, beyond its own, uh, let's say, declarations of collaboration and openness. Um, I would like to highlight that the Missing Migrants Project, for example, estimates that 23,675 people died crossing the Mediterranean since 2014. And people are attempting to cross the Atlantic through the Canaries route. Um, the IOM has registered 900 deaths in this route just last year. And 150 died crossing the channel between the UK and France in the last five years. At land borders, at least 17 people died at the polish Belarusian border last year. These of course are skewed numbers since we will never know how many people have actually been killed through Europe's migration border management system which entails many other kinds of death as like ripple effects. Um, the European Union as a collaboration of nations Further relies on values of inclusivity, but the EU migration management system, which normalizes racial violence, gives us an idea of who is included in this imagined way of life. And clearly who is not. We continue to connect the current migration management activities of the EU to the colonial expansion and extraction, past and present. Um, and 
and how they are affecting people on the move due to climate change. Do you want to add something? Uh, not at this point, no. Okay. Well, okay. We, I know that we said a lot of complicated words, um, so please feel free to ask us to expand on some. We just tried to condense a lot of information, so we're very happy to talk about it in detail. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very intriguing and insightful lecture slash short summary of your project. Um, FYI, we will stop the recording now and would head into the Q&A.